In my early teens, I set off on a number of programming projects that never quite worked out. It was just beyond the capabilities of what I had at the time for them ever to be successful. I have mentioned these before, but there was that one adventure game that represents a whole bucket of ramifications about how I do problem solving and how I've tried to take on impossible projects. And I feel like the initial notes of that game's attempt was a symphony that I've been playing ever since. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. The very first commercial piece of software that I acquired for my IBM PC was Zork 2 by Infocom. I'm not sure, looking back, why that attracted me or why I would try to play number two in a series, but that was the game I bought, and I took it home and I played it. It blew me away doing full-sentence interactions with a virtual world that was being described to me in text. It was overwhelming enough that I had the same illusion that I'd had with Adventure a few years earlier, that the game was somehow making it up as I went along, that it couldn't possibly know everything I was going to do, and having so many ready answers for every question or action and demand I made of it fulfilled the illusion utterly for me. As I tried to do a puzzle where there was a key in a keyhole and I figured out how to put a newspaper underneath it and make the key go out and, and push the key out to land on the paper, this all felt like a real world existed on this floppy disk. This idea and illusion inspired me to make my own, only in the realm and expanse of time and adulthood. Do I really understand how completely ridiculous and doomed this undertaking was? The programming necessary to make a Zork world happen required an MIT engineer level of knowledge. Setting aside the actual problems of fitting on a disk, just being able to type in all of this text and have it do everything that was possible was functionally an absolute folly. But at 13, I just didn't know any better. I set off as many of those journeys did, putting in lines of basic code, using the remark function to list what I was going to do, and then constructing, as I went, usually without notes, where the program would take input and make decisions. In the modern era, a 13-year-old Jason would have used some sort of engine, like Twine or even Unreal, learning from a manual all of the arguments and structures I had to put together, maybe even using some sort of template to be able to make everything function on a basic level before adding all of my customizations. But back then, there was nothing. There was just typing input a dollar sign, analyzing what a dollar sign was, figuring out what the words were, doing a check against a table of text, and keeping a range of variables going on, variables that would tell me what location I was in, what room number it was, where other exits were, and where I could make things function, and where, based on a huge set of if-then statements, putting together all of the contingencies that could exist. Truly, the mists of time have obscured most of my thought process. I know that it was summer, that I was working on this at home, not going outside, staying pale in my father's dining room, working on this PC with its bright, dull hum, and 
typing in on this beautiful clicking metal keyboard my visualizations, my perceptions of what the program should be keeping track of. I know that I understood that rooms needed to be assigned individual numbers, that your location and what room you were in was another variable, and that there had to be ways to know what exits linked between which rooms. That fundamental understanding needed some amount of note-taking, some graph paper with different drawings on it, long lost in the mists of time and movement, and which I recall was simplicity indeed. A field, the outside of a castle, a forest, ideas that I'd lifted both from Zork and from Adventure, that you had to have some sort of outdoors world with a simple fundamental description, and anything in the description needed to have a reference if the player mentioned it. If you mention a moon, you have to do something with the moon. If you talk about a tree, you have to tell them they can't climb it. And if there's a river, you are not going to be swimming in it. In fact, a lot of what I was doing was trying to figure out how to let the player down, to tell them that functionality, that command wouldn't work, that I was acknowledging their interest in it, but that it was not going to happen. I had a very fundamental layout. It was a simple grid, probably 8 by 10, which was still 80 locations I had to start to think about. And one solution I had was to assign a variable to various parts, subparts really, of a description. There is a tree here, there is a river here, there is grass here, each individually becoming variables, and then having an array that would tell you that in this room the following descriptions were being used and put together. What this translated to was a very rote, repetitive description set. You would go from one room and it would have a tree and a river, and you'd go to another and it would have a river and a tree. But to me, being able to walk around these locations, to be able to say north and east and south and west, was building a world, a simple one, one which I would then pass on to others to puzzle through what I had left for them, what I had put behind me for their amusement, entertainment, and challenge. It took me days and days to write this code. I'm sure it, I'm positive it ballooned into the dozens and then hundreds of lines, absolutely inefficient to the extreme. I was not somebody who was constantly trying to find the most efficient way to make things function. I am sure that I had more redundant code in there, something which even a first or second year engineering student would have turned into a single basic function within minutes of looking at my code. But I was playing alone. It was just me and my instrument, my gray box where my dreams lived. This project sustained me through that summer. It was me building a world, giving it a name, with the idea that it would eventually end up being played by others. But in almost spectacular fashion, I remember what finally did me in. I wanted a grenade, a grenade that you were using to blast into the side of a castle. You see, the idea was that instead of trying to get over the moat to the closed door, you secretly had to use an explosive to blow up the side of the castle and go in that way. And that was the puzzle. But that meant that I had to create a grenade object, one that could be picked up and dropped, one which could be set off dropped, and which in some way would explode a number of turns later. This was a nightmare. Keeping track of time, coming up with the command set to manipulate a grenade, and then running a whole set of if-then statements to figure out every possible contingency of interaction with this grenade. I mean, what do you do if you drop a grenade and then walk away two sectors, two rooms away from it? 
What sort of sound is made? What if it's one room over, one location nearby? What if you're there when it happens? What if you witness what's going on with the wall? Or you're at the wall and then you're one sector away. Do you get to hear the wall breaking and turning into rubble? And what happens if you blow it up anywhere else, near a river, near a tree, near stones? What seemed so simple, so easy, having a puzzle and then working out all of the contingencies, absolutely overflowed my tiny teenage brain. I had found my own personal limit. I mean, to be sure, I definitely tried. I wrote dozens and dozens and dozens of lines of code trying to set up every possible grenade contingency in my tiny 80-room grid. But at the end of the day, I believe I had it sort of working, sort of functioning, sort of doing what I'd wanted it to do. And it was only then that I realized this puzzle, this grenade situation, was only the first in what was going to have to be many, many different puzzles in this world, this whole collection of interlocking possibilities based on time, contingency, and location. And I understood at that moment, as summer turned into fall, that it was not going to happen this year. So... I took the disc and I put it away. Time and distance have lost me that data. I don't have it anymore. Believe me, if I did, I would have found it long before this. I would have definitely transferred that floppy, put that item up, and try to see what my distant memories, my foggy remembrances of this coding actually was. I'd love to know that I was doing some smart things, writing some really clever ideas while being stumped by the big stuff. I just didn't have a mentor or a playtester at the time. I just didn't have that critical social infrastructure that's the difference between toiling alone and succeeding with friends. Of all the lessons I learned, of all of the edges and use cases of my abilities that I pulled away from that summer of toiling over a grenade in a field, I think the fact that I need people, that without collaboration and cooperation, I'm probably doomed, that was the solution to the puzzle that I've been carrying with me ever since. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bequianu, Mark Pilgrim, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Craig Talbert, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, Sembiance, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. There is always the possibility that buried in one particular box, under a misleading label, is my code. My floppies from my teenage years. And I certainly have the tools to read those floppies, should they ever pop up again. But I have some pretty severe doubts. It's been almost 40 years since I touched these floppies and there's been a lot of life in between now and then. The lessons that I took, the memories I have, they'll do. I don't need code, specific printouts, specific pieces and artifacts of me to know that I bring it with me wherever I go. I love it when something that is long lost is found again. That's what I've been living for the past few decades. But the flip side of it is to never, and I mean never, act like not having something is a personal failure. <laughs>